Now, if you guys have your guys' Bibles, 1 Samuel 3, we don't need any screens this morning. The early church didn't have screens, so that means that all of you guys need to pay attention even more, right? And you guys got to follow along with me as we read the Bible passage, our passage for this morning. And we will read a familiar passage, actually. Um, Today, we'll be looking at Samuel's calling, his calling. Remember, Hannah had dedicated Samuel to the Lord for a lifetime of service. Now, this chapter tells the story of Samuel's first experience as a prophet of the Lord. Samuel continued to carry out his duties and service to the Lord under the care and leadership of Eli, who was the priest of the tabernacle at Shiloh. And then last week in chapter 2, we were introduced to Eli's wicked sons. And that is no exaggeration. These guys profane the Lord's sacrifice. How so? Well, they kept the fat of the meat for themselves. You see, the law required that the fat be burned off the meat before it was eaten. The fat of the meat was considered the best part, the most luxurious part. I mean, it's a, it was considered a delicacy. And the, the fact Because of that fact alone, it was required to give it as an offering to the Lord. It belonged to the Lord. That's what the law required as an act of worship. And it would create smoke, and it would create this pleasing aroma unto the Lord. Now, if you guys like the smell of bacon, how many of you guys like the smell of bacon? You guys know what I'm talking about. Or some carne asada on the grill. There you go. I don't want to get you guys hungry, but that's how they profaned the sacrifice. But not only did they profane the Lord's sacrifice, they also abused their power, as we read. They slept with several women. These guys were corrupt. They were literally running amok. They were running amok. And friends, you can't make a mockery out of God. No, 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 no. And then in chapter 2, we are told that The Lord sends a godly man, and he pronounces a prophecy of judgment against the house of Eli and his family. Now, up until this point from the beginning of Samuel, we have been presented with two examples. We see the contrast of two women in the beginning. In chapter 1, we have Peninnah and Hannah. Peninnah was arrogant. She was cruel. She was not so righteous. While Hannah was just the exact opposite. She was humble. She was kind. She was patient. She was faithful. She was righteous. And in chapter 2, the author gives us another contrast between priests. We see the faithfulness of Samuel with the faithlessness of Eli's sons. Now, this comparison between two is actually found all throughout The scriptures, later in the book of Samuel, we will encounter a contrast between kings, King Saul and King David. And this comparison between two really comes down to a verse found back in chapter 2, at the end of verse 30, if you guys want to note that. But at the end of verse 30, in chapter 2, it says this, For those who honor me, I will honor, but those who despise me, will be disgraced. Eli and his wicked sons despise the Lord. Samuel, on the other hand, honors the Lord. And the contrast between priests continues on here in chapter 3. And so we have quite a bit to cover this morning, so let's go ahead and let's work our way through these verses together. And if you're a note taker, um, I know we don't have uh, the screens available, but you can write this down. Uh, For point number one, this is the call from the Lord. The call from the Lord, verses 1 through 10 here. So let's go ahead, if you have your Bibles of chapter 3, starting in verse 1, where the Lord says this, The boy Samuel served the Lord in Eli's presence. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare, and prophetic visions were not widespread. One day, Eli whose eyesight was failing, was lying in his usual place. 
Before the lamp of God had gone out, Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was located. And we'll stop right there. Now our passage begins with Samuel serving the Lord. Samuel is a servant. We are told this several times back in chapter 2. The author is emphasizing this to us, the readers. We begin to see this contrast here. He is the true servant of the Lord, and he does so under Eli. Now, Samuel's exact age here is not known to us, um, but most scholars believe that he was between the ages of 11 and 14. Um, so he was probably a tween teen here at this point. And I'm sure uh, Eli benefited from this. I mean, having a kid around at this age was really helpful for the guy. I mean, Eli is getting old. He's getting up there in age. I'm sure he had Samuel picking up the trash around the tabernac uh, tabernacle, making sure that the place was nice and tidy. I mean, Eli couldn't do it. I mean, I'm sure bending over probably hurt the guy, if I'm being honest. But I can imagine Eli telling little Samuel, Samuel, can, can you go wipe off the excess oil off the, the lampstand, please? And can you clean that up? Yeah, yeah, sure. I'm ready to go, Eli. And just little Samuel just runs off and just starts cleaning up. He was ready to do it. And what a great example in Samuel. Now, little ones in the room, please hear me out. And parents, please, too. You, too. High school students, junior high students, you're never too young to serve the Lord. Never too young to serve the Lord. Samuel is a perfect example of this. And parents, we should encourage our children to serve the Lord. We should. It's a beautiful thing. I mean, little Samuel here serving in the tabernacle. And so as parents, we should do everything that we possibly can to encourage our little ones. Come have them drop them off, pick up trash around the church. Come talk to me. Put them, you know, give them some work to do. But it's, it's a beautiful thing. And I love seeing our students work and serve here on Sunday mornings. And so it's great to see that. Um, but Samuel, as we read, is ministering and serving the Lord. And we are told at the end of verse 1 that the word of the Lord was rare and prophetic visions were not widespread. Now, what was the cause of this? Well, during this time period, let me remind all of you that everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And this means bad news. Bad news for Several reasons. It means bad news because the Lord is far from the wicked. Proverbs 15 verse 29 tells us. It's bad news because the Lord is set against those who do evil. Psalm 34 verse 16. And if you remember a few weeks back, we looked at Hannah's prayer of praise in chapter 2. And in verse 10, we are told that those who oppose the Lord will be shattered, will be shattered. Listen, the silence of God can be linked to divine displeasure. And this is probably why the rest of the nation of Israel was so spiritually sick because of poor leadership, of poor influence. The priests who have been appointed by God to act as mediators between men and God himself who were Hophni and Phinehas, were wicked. Eli, Eli, who was a high priest, rebuked Hannah harshly for her godliness as she was pouring herself out before the Lord back in chapter 1. And yet Eli does nothing to correct his own wicked sons. Of course the word of the Lord was rare. Of course there were no prophetic visions. None of those things were common. Why? Why? Why would the Lord continue to speak when the priests and the people of that day were not even listening themselves? See, this word listening will be very crucial for the rest of the morning. It's a key word as we continue on our study. But there was poor influence 
And there was poor integrity. Poor integrity. And verses 2 and 3 gives us further background and details that is simply filled with symbolism here. In verse 2, we are told that Eli's eyesight was failing him. I mean, yes, the guy is getting old. And I'm sure he probably had maybe a few cataracts or two in his eyes. His vision was becoming cloudy. But spiritually speaking, it was no different. His spiritual sight was also weak. Again, going back to Hannah in chapter 1. Eli is so spiritually blind, he can't recognize godliness right in front of his own two eyes as Hannah was praying. In verse 3, is interesting. It says, before the lamp of God had gone out, the lampstand, or the menorah, which was located on the left side upon entering the holy place, not the holy of holies, it's the holy place. You had two rooms, and as soon as you entered this room, on the left side, you had the golden lampstand, you had the table of showbread, you had the altar of incense, and then the room behind that, there was a curtain, you had the Ark of the Covenant. But this lamp was kept burning from evening until early morning or dawn. And it provided light in the darkness. This too is also symbolic. Before the lamp of God had gone out, the lamp of God is still burning even in the midst of Shiloh's darkness. It was about to go out. Eli couldn't tend to it because of his eyesight. Probably didn't know it was about to go out. But Samuel's there. He's there. And even though things are grim, God's light will still burn bright and will do so through Samuel. And it is just before dawn that Samuel gets called by the Lord, as we soon will read. However, even Samuel lying down in the Lord's temple where the ark of God was is also symbolic. It's symbolic of his closeness to God while the others, while the other priests were distant. We can begin to see the contrast here between Samuel, Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas here. Now, just because God is silent doesn't mean he is not working. The Lord will break his silence here shortly. But the Lord has had enough and is raising a prophet for himself. And so let's go ahead and let's read verses 4 through 10 together. Starting in verse 4, Then the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, Here I am. He ran to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me? I didn't call, Eli replied. Go back and, and, and lie down. So he went and lay down. Once again, the Lord called Samuel. Samuel got up, went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me? I didn't call you, my son, he replied. Go back and, and lie down. Verse 7. Now Samuel did not know the Lord because the word of the Lord had not been revealed to him. Once again, for the third time, the Lord called Samuel. He got up, went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me? Then Eli understood that the Lord was calling the boy. He told Samuel, go and lie down. If he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. In verse 10, the Lord came, stood there, and called as before, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel responded, speak, for your servant is listening. And we'll stop right there. We're going to spend a good chunk of our time here in these verses and there are four observations that I want to point out for us. And again, if you're taking notes, these points will be helpful. And our first observation is this. It's Samuel's eagerness to serve. Samuel's eagerness to serve. Church, I want you to try to picture this scene in your head, okay? You have a young teenage boy in Samuel sleeping next to the Ark of the Covenant. I mean, if you have a teenager, you know that they love sleep, right? Yes, they do. They love to sleep. Who doesn't? 
And the Lord is calling Samuel, and he does so four times here in these verses. But the first initial three, Samuel doesn't know it's the Lord. He thinks it's Eli. However, all four times, Samuel gets up, and this little guy is just eager and ready to serve. Verse 5 tells us that the guy ran. He didn't walk. He wasn't crawling on the ground. He didn't stumble out of the bed. I mean, he actually, he probably did stumble if he was ready to run. But this guy just ran to Eli. His zeal is inspiring. Here I am. You called me? Says Samuel. He's ready to carry out Eli's instructions and hear from the Lord on the fourth time. Now Samuel could have gotten up after the first time the Lord had called him and just went back to sleep and stay asleep. He doesn't do that. He's eager. And I love this about Samuel. We get to see this young boy's character here. And what we can learn from Samuel is this. The mark of a faithful servant is one who has an attentive ear, and is ready for immediate action. I will say that again. The mark of a faithful servant is one who has an attentive ear and is ready for immediate action. Let me ask you this. Do you think Hophni and Phinehas were just as eager to follow and do what their father was instructing them? No. Look, as a pastor, you know what I love? And I'm sure the other pastors would agree. We love seeing people in the church who are like Samuel, who have that attentive ear. They listen out for what needs to be done, and then they do it. Hey, I heard you can use some more volunteers in children's ministry. Here I am. Hey, I heard about this event that this church is doing. You're going to go ahead, and you're going to minister to the widows and the widowers, right? Yeah, we are. Here I am. How can I help? And friends, we need more people like this in the church. People who are ready and eager to serve the Lord. It doesn't matter if it's in the middle of the night, before dawn, whenever. But as much as I love people who are eager and ready to serve, there's something else that the Lord loves more, that I love, that even we, the pastors of Temple Baptist Church, love. And I'll tell you more about that here shortly. But the second observation we see in these verses is this. Samuel doesn't know the Lord. Now, after the second time the Lord had called Samuel, we are told in verse 7 that Samuel did not yet know the Lord because the word of the Lord had not been revealed to him. Meaning this, Samuel has not had an encounter with the Lord. He has never received divine revelation from God. So when the Lord is calling him, he doesn't know that it's God initially. Because the word of the Lord had not been revealed to him, verse 7 says. Now, back in chapter 2, this is interesting. In verse 12, we are told that Eli's sons were worthless, <laughs> and they too did not know the Lord. And yet they were priests. Both they and Samuel knew much of the Lord for sure, without a doubt. I mean, Samuel had been serving the Lord for years by this time, and Eli's sons knew enough about the Lord to serve the people on his behalf as well. The difference was, was that Eli's sons, who were grown adults, didn't know the Lord in the sense that they did not seem to fear him or obey him. They didn't obey God. We know that they disrespected the Lord. They profaned his sacrifices. We know they were fornicators, sleeping with women. They also certainly did didn't seem to have ever heard from God directly. Samuel's relationship, on the other hand, it's a little different. Samuel's relationship to the Lord, God of Israel, was very personal, as we will soon see. Very personal, in a way that Eli's sons never was. The contrast between Samuel here is Samuel's obedience in regard to Hophni and Phinehas, who, again, despise the Lord. 
Now this contrast between both of them here is actually very striking. It is. And though Samuel did not know the Lord, our God is a God of knowledge, if you remember. God knows Samuel's heart here. Later in 1 Samuel 16, verse 7, the Lord tells Samuel that humans did not see what the Lord sees, for humans see what is visible. But the Lord sees the heart, and God knows Samuel. He knows his heart. He knows his heart. He knew that Samuel would obey, which leads me to this thought for all of this this morning. As we're talking about Hophni and Phineas, it's possible, church, to serve the Lord and yet not know him. It is. It's possible to serve the Lord and not know him personally, not fearing him or obeying him. And friends, this is dangerous. Just because you are serving in the church or have served in the church doesn't mean you know the Lord. It doesn't even mean you're saved. And me, being raised in the church, I mean, my goodness, I've seen it all. I can't tell you how many times I've come across people who are serving at one time and are not following the Lord, the Lord now. I've seen pastors serve and lead churches and not even know the Lord. I have personally served in worship ministry for years, and I've come across people who have once led worship on a stage and yet not know the Lord. We've seen that recently in the last couple of years with Christian music artists who are not walking with the Lord, who do not know the Lord. Friends, here at Temple Baptist Church, we desire for all who serve the Lord to know the Lord, to know the Lord personally, to know the Lord intimately. And we do so because I mean, for a variety of reasons, I can go off and just list you many reasons as to why, but don't let mere service for him lead you to think that all is well, please. The third observation I want to point out is this, and it's found in verse 8. Let's read verse 8 together. Once again, for the third time, the Lord called Samuel. He got up, went to Eli, and said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli understood that the Lord was calling the boy. Third observation, the realization of Eli. The realization of Eli, the Lord calls out for Samuel a third time, and after the third time, Eli finally realizes it was the Lord. Now in all of this, you can imagine God having a little fun here. Three times, Samuel goes to Eli and wakes up old Eli. I mean, Eli, probably cranky, who knows? I doubt it, only because of his response here in just a sec. Maybe he might have gotten grouchy. I mean, we know old men like to sleep too. But something is happening here. There is not, that has not happened for years here in Shiloh for a very long time. And it's the Lord speaking. And Eli picks up on this. You see, the interesting word here in verse 8 is the word understood. Now, our version says understood, but other versions, such as the New King's James Version or the ESV, if you guys have that, the word used there is perceived. And the NASB, the word there is realized. So you have perceived, you have realized, you have understood. But the point is this, it took Eli a few times. It took him a few times to realize and perceive that God was talking to Samuel. He was slow to understand. You see, not only was Eli spiritually blind, but now we see he is spiritually deaf. As a priest, his perception was not there. It was not. And friends, this is what sin will do to you. 
This is what sin will do to you. The sin we commit in our own lives can blind us spiritually and it can cause deafness to the things of the Lord. And over time, if we completely leave sin unchecked, we can completely lose our eyesight, spiritually speaking, and hearing. And this, we, we, we again, we, again, we begin to see this in the life of Eli. Now, the last and final observation found in these verses, verses 9 and 10, is this observation number four. True servants of the Lord listen and obey. Now, this observation is slightly similar to observation number one. However, observation number one highlighted Samuel's eagerness. Yes, we love to see eager people serve the Lord here at Temple Baptist Church. But something that the Lord loves more, something that we love more, are servants who listen to the Lord and are willing and ready to obey Him more than anything. True servants of the Lord listen and obey. Let's read verse 9 and 10 together. It says this, He, or Eli, told Samuel, Go and lie down. If He calls you, say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went out and lay down in his place. In verse 10, the Lord came, stood there, and called as before, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel responded, speak, for your servant is listening. Now in verse 9, we see Eli giving instructions on how to respond to the Lord after finally realizing that it was him. And what I find interesting is this is that Eli was giving instructions to Samuel, even though he was not even listening himself to the Lord, in a sense. I mean, when it came to his own two sons. But how gracious, though, is Eli? This old saint is still guiding this young man. He's guiding him. He could have been upset, at Samuel. He could have been jealous of Samuel. He's not jealous of him, though. The Lord should have been talking to Eli, but nope, he's talking to Samuel. He's talking to Samuel. And what Eli does is, at least in all that, he directs the guy, and he's helpful. And in verse 10, we see the Lord calling Samuel here for the fourth time. This time, the Lord repeats his name twice. He says, Samuel, Samuel, says the Lord. This is, rem this is reminiscent of the divine calling to Abraham on Mount Moriah in Genesis chapter 22 and verse 1 and 11. Abraham, Abraham. But also, if you're familiar with Exodus and Moses and the, bur and the burning bush, Moses, Moses. This similarity suggests that this moment was an important, crucial moment in Samuel's life and all of Israel. God had a special calling for Samuel, and Samuel obediently identified himself as the Lord's servant, but also one who is listening. I told you that's going to be a key word for all of us this morning. I don't want you to miss this. The Hebrew word for listening here, and we've heard it before, Pastor Jeremy shared it with all of you last week, is Shema. Shema. It means to not only listen, but to obey. He's willing to hear, Samuel's willing to hear instructions from the Lord and obey it and carry it out. Eli and his wicked sons have heard and know the Lord's instructions. However, they were not obeying his command. They were not shamoing. Eli refused to heed, or Eli's sons refused to heed their father's warnings. They may have heard what he had said, but they weren't listening. Eli wasn't listening to God, to the godly man back in chapter 2. You know, both of my boys, I got both of my boys some, some hockey sticks, Elijah and Levi, and, and they love to play hockey. Um, Elijah's taking some hockey classes right now. But there was one day 
where both my boys were playing hockey in the living room. We have hardwood floors, and Elijah has his hockey stick, and Levi has his hockey stick, and Elijah is slapping the puck around on the floor, and Levi is slapping a, a ball, a hockey ball on the floor, right? But my second oldest, Levi, let's just say he can be a bully. <laughs> so for those of you guys who watch him in the nursery, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just warning you. He, he can be a bully. And what this little guy does, Levi doesn't want to hit the hockey ball. He wants to hit the puck, just like his older brother. And so what he does is he tosses the hockey ball to the side, and he goes, and he picks up Elijah's puck. Elijah's on his rollerblades, right? So he can't stop him. Um, Levi doesn't have rollerblades yet, um, but he probably will soon. But Levi takes the puck away from Elijah, and he begins to slap it around on the floor. And he begins to, to hit it around around the house. And Elijah's not having it. Elijah's not having it. I mean, Elijah, Elijah can be, Elijah's very tough as well. And so what he does is he hits Levi with the hockey stick. You know, and it's funny because I think Elijah's trying to be careful. He doesn't want to hit too hard, but he's just like slapping him. And Levi, he's not going to have it either. And so the guy with his hockey stick starts hitting Elijah back. And I'm watching this. I'm, 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 I'm a messed up parent. I know because I find it amusing. I'm just like, these guys are hitting each other. What in the world? And let's just say things got out of hand. And it got to the point where Elijah got so mad that he hit Levi really hard with his hockey stick on the shoulder. And Levi just dropped his hockey stick. And this guy just begins to scream and starts crying like loud. I should tell you, though, as before things got intense, before actually Elijah actually hit Levi, I, I did tell him. I yelled, like, guys, knock it off. Knock it off. Listen. But they didn't. And eventually, again. Now I have another toddler just in pain and crying. And, he, and Elijah knows that he messed up. And this is something about my boy. Man, I got I to gotta watch out for this because he can be very manipulative. But he goes, Papa, Papa, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, I love you. I love you. I mean, the guy knows he messed up. He took it too far. I love you. Son, I got to give you a pow-pow. I call him pow-pows at the house. I got to give you a pow-pow. <laughs> No, Papa, no, Papa, I, I, I love you, please, I, I, I love you. And I respond, Elijah, son, if you love me, listen to what I'm talking to you. Obey me. <laughs> what I tell him? It's one thing to hear instruction, but it's also another to obey. So you can hear the Lord's instructions found in his word, but it's another thing to obey it. And you know, Samuel, Samuel's name in Hebrew, here's an here's interesting little tidbit, golden nuggets. It's Shemuel in Hebrew. And it means the Lord has heard. You can even hear in the name Shemuel, Samuel, being close to the word Shema. The Lord has heard Hannah's prayer back in chapter 1, and now Samuel's ready to hear from the Lord himself. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Later on, God will go on and tell Samuel, Speak, servant, for your Lord hears. Because Samuel became a great man of prayer. But let's move on. That was the fourth and final observation. But now we're going to move on to the message from the Lord found in verses 11 through 14. So this would be technically point number two for you guys. The message from the Lord, starting in verse 11, it says this, The Lord said to Samuel, I am about to do something in Israel that will cause everyone who hears about it to shudder. On that day, I will carry out against Eli everything I said about his family from beginning to end. I told him that I'm going to judge his family forever because of the iniquity he knows about. His sons are cursing God, and he has not stopped them. Therefore... I have sworn to Eli's family, the iniquity of Eli's family will never be wiped out by either sacrifice or offering. Now Samuel is ready to listen to the Lord, and the Lord speaks. 
employ, oh boy, is it a heavy message. It's a heavy message, one that will cause all ears to shudder, verse 11 says. Some versions say tingle. It will cause all ears to tingle, meaning it's going to cause great fear in a lot of people. It's going to cause fear all throughout Israel. You know, as I was studying, preparing for this message, as a minister of the gospel, a pastor, and I could speak the same for the other pastors here, we're not here, I'm not here to tickle <laughs> your guys' ears. None of the pastors here do. We're not here to preach what you want to hear. We preach the truth. We preach Bible. And sometimes we preach passages in the Bible that might cause people to shudder, including myself, if I'm honest. And why will Israel shudder? Because it's a message of destruction brought on the house of Eli to priest. Eli was warned about this back in chapter 2 by a godly man. The house of Eli will be cut off from the priesthood because of their sin. The ultimate judgment is death. Both Hophni and Phinehas will both die at the same time, and later Eli will die. And church, this should not come to be a surprise to us. I mean, if you've been studying for Samuel with us, back in chapter 2, in verse 6, the Lord brings death and gives life. He sends some down to Sheol and he raises other up, others up. The Lord will bring about the death of both Hophni and Phinehas. In verse 9 of Hannah's prayer in chapter 2, he guards the steps of the faithful ones, but the wicked perish in darkness. Eli's sons were wicked men. In verse 10 of chapter 2, those who oppose the Lord will be shattered. He will thunder in the heavens against them. Eli's sons had no respect for the Lord. They despised him. They opposed God and their own father. And those who oppose the Lord will be shattered. He will thunder in the heavens against such people. Eli should not be surprised by this. The Lord is confirming this judgment to little Samuel. Friends, God is holy. There's no one like him. We read that in chapter 2. I mean, the title of this morning's message was the calling of Samuel, but if I could change it, I could probably just change it to the holiness of God, or God doesn't mess around. God is holy. And what we see here, friends, is the consequence of sin, and Eli did nothing about it. Look at verse 13. I told him that I'm going to judge his family forever because of the iniquity he knows about. His sons are cursing God, and he has not stopped them. Now, one thing that Pastor Jeremy shared last week was this. Parents, we can't love our children more than we love God. Eli rebuked his children, but clearly it wasn't enough. He needed to do something about it. He had to. He could have. He was the high priest. But he didn't do anything to stop them. And parents in the room and all those living with parents, please hear me out here. And I say this with all sincerity. And I want to be truthful and loving. As long as your children are living underneath your roof, it doesn't matter how old they are. They could be grown adults. Listen, your home is your home. And you will be held responsible for what goes on in your house. Parents, you have the power and control to determine what happens in your home. Don't be like Eli. Don't just give a rebuke and say, well, I told them what they were doing was wrong. They know what they're doing is wrong against God. God will punish them. God will take care of them. Listen, simply telling them is not enough, as we see in these verses. Take action if you need to. You guys are technically the priest of your own home. And if you're living with parents, students, 
junior high, high school students, listen to your parents. They have rules. Obey them. Listen to them. As long as you're living underneath their roof, guess what? Whatever they say goes. Until you leave that house and go somewhere else, then you can do whatever the heck you want. And parents, if you let things slide, be sure of this, the Lord won't. You can't make a mockery out of God. James chapter 4, verse 17 tells us this, So it is a sin to know the good and yet not do it. Or in other words, to know the right thing to do and not do it is a sin. Eli had disobeyed the Lord and put his family first. And so God could not speak directly to him. That's why he speaks to Samuel. The judgment that God will bring upon this family is horrible. Verse 14 doesn't make it any better. Therefore, I have sworn to Eli's family the iniquity of Eli's family will never be wiped out by either sacrifice or offering. The Lord tells Samuel that Eli's family's sins will never be atoned for by sacrifice or offering. The sacrificial system was the means that God established by which those in Israel could have their sins atoned for or paid for or covered over by the blood of animals. The law even allowed for specific offerings to cover the sins of priests in Leviticus. But man, the sins of Eli's sons were so egregious, they knowingly and willfully sinned against God. They did so by corrupting and scorning the sacrificial system of Israel itself and living immoral lives. And so the Lord's judgment on them was that no sacrifice or offering could cover their offenses against God. And this is tragic. You know what this means? It means this, that they would be cut off. They were to be casted out or excommunicated from Israel, and it meant instant death. And we're told that in Numbers 15. And for Hophni and Phinehas, it did. Soon we will find out that Hophni and Phinehas both die in battle. But I can't imagine how Samuel must have felt hearing this message from the Lord. I mean, a teenage boy, this most definitely would have weighed heavily upon Samuel's little heart. I mean, Samuel loved Eli. He was his grandfather, in a sense. He cared for him, taught him about the Lord. And he'd, so, and he'd learned so much from him. But as we see, we know that Samuel must be true to the Lord. He must crucify his emotions, I guess you could say. And he's got to relay this message to the person that he loves in spite of his personal desires towards Eli. But let's go ahead and let's close out these verses, verses 15 through 18. This is the message relayed, starting in verse 15. Samuel laid down until the morning. Then he opened the doors of the Lord's house. He was afraid to tell Eli the vision. But Eli called him and said, Samuel, my son, here I am, answered Samuel. What was the message he gave you, Eli asked. Don't hide it from me. May God punish you and do so severely if you hide anything from me that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and did not hide anything from him. Eli responded, he is the Lord. Let him do what he thinks is good. Now Samuel stays in bed until morning. We don't know if he was able to sleep. I doubt it. I mean, I know I couldn't have, that's for sure. But he was just in bed, lying there for the next few hours. And then when it's morning, he gets up and Scripture tells us that he opened the doors. He's ready to serve, ready to listen to Eli. And then we are told that he's afraid in verse 15. And then Eli then calls Samuel in verse 16, and Samuel again listens. Here I am, answered Samuel. And Eli explains to Samuel that it's, that it's his duty to, to deliver the message the Lord gave to him and to not leave anything else. Now, this is the moment that Samuel probably dreaded. I mean, I could just imagine the little guy in the tabernacle sweeping around and 
Eli calls him over, Samuel, come here. And he's just like, oh. I mean, the little guy probably just feels it in his stomach. Here I am, answered Samuel. And then Samuel delivers. Samuel describes the Lord's message of judgment against Eli and his family. And old Eli responds almost with a shrug. He is the Lord. Let him do what he thinks is good. Now Eli's response is not surprising. I mean, he didn't take action when he should have concerning his sons. But at least the guy understands the Lord's sovereignty here. He knows that the Lord can and will do whatever he pleases. The guy was just, to be honest, he's just waiting for the sword to fall at this point. Now, I know we've been getting on Eli's case here. And after this morning, he's not portrayed as a good person, especially for being a priest. Eli has his faults, no doubt. But if I'm being honest, we all do. We do see some good in the guy. The guy is looking out for Samuel. Later, we know that Eli had a concern for the ark of God and for the future of Israel as a whole. But if Eli could have shown the exact same concern for his sons when they were younger, perhaps things could have been different. Probably. But up until this point, though, if I'm being honest, for Samuel, Hannah is the one who still stands out to us. She is the faithful, godly woman. As we continue with Samuel, we learn about Samuel's kids who go off and they go astray. We learn about Saul and his disobedience. We even see that in King David, he had his failures. But the point is this, though, is that we all make mistakes. We will sin. But what should our response be towards sin? We cannot be apathetic. We cannot be indifferent towards it. No. We must take action. We must confess the sin. We must repent of sin. Later, we read in the Psalms that David confesses his sin. But guys, church, let us learn from Eli. And later, even Samuel, when he's old, let us learn from these guys. Let us learn from Saul and David. These guys serve as examples for us to learn from them. Let's finish off these verses, 19 through 21. This is the last and final point. The prophet affirmed. The prophet affirmed. Verse 19. Samuel grew. The Lord was with him, and he fulfilled everything Samuel prophesied. And all of Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was confirmed prophet of the Lord. The Lord continued to appear in Shiloh because there he revealed himself to Samuel by his word. In chapter 4, verse 1, it says, And Samuel's words came to all Israel. Now Samuel continues to grow up and continues to receive messages from the Lord for his people. The Lord was with him. And his prayer again back in chapter 2. He guards the steps of his faithful ones. This is little Samuel. The Lord was with him, and the Lord does not allow any of Samuel's prophetic words to fall on the ground, meaning they held true. There was nothing false about his words that came out of his mouth. And because of this, everyone in Israel knew that Samuel was the true prophet of the Lord, verse 20 tells us. And as we get to the last verse, not only did Samuel grow up physically, but spiritually as well. The Lord continued to appear in Shiloh. Because there he revealed himself to Samuel by his words. He continues to speak to Samuel. Now friends, you want to grow spiritually. Look, it's not found in secular education or secular books. It's not found in some meditation exercises. It's not found on taking a long journey across the earth, visiting different places, trying to connect spiritually and to be in tune with yourself. 
you want to grow spiritually, it's found in God's Word. The Word of God, the Word of God, and His Word alone is what changes hearts along with His Spirit. Be influenced by His Word. You want God to speak audibly to you out loud like he did to Samuel? Read the word of God out loud. And he'll speak. He'll speak, which must be willing and ready to listen. Samuel was being shaped by his word, and soon Israel was about to experience a new beginning through Samuel and his ministry. But as we close this morning, I'm going to ask the worship team to come on up. Just to kind of recap, because I know we don't have the slides here, a few takeaways. Let's be like Samuel. Let us be eager to serve the Lord and say, here I am. I'm ready. I'm ready to serve you. Let us hear from the Lord through his word and obey it. Let us know the Lord personally and intimately. Let us learn from Eli and not be like his wicked sons. Will we fail? Absolutely. But let's, but let's not be apathetic towards sin. Let us not shrug our shoulders. Let us repent and confess our sin and, and jump back in the word and continue to hear from it. And as we do so, we do so not only for our sake, but like Samuel, who will influence a whole nation, we too can influence our nation. We can influence our family, our friends, our neighbors. As we are being changed by his word, we can influence the city, the city of Paris, and influence the world. And that is my prayer for us as a church this morning. Now, things are going to get really intense next week. You're not going to want to miss next week, I promise. So make sure you're here 10 a.m. But man, I... I'll just leave with this final thought. I was preparing for this message. This was even heavy even for myself. It was one of those moments where I'm just like, oh. And I just start thinking about even my own kids as they grow up and they get older. But friends, church, I pray that we would just learn and that we take heed to the Lord's instruction, his word for us this morning. Let's pray. Let's come before the Lord and let's pray.